my name is Kelly Sorensen. If we haven't met, I want to introduce myself. I'm the executive director at Ventana Wildlife Society. Uh, we have quite a few members of our team today uh, as part of our monthly Condor Zoom chat, which, by the way, uh, are being held on the last Thursday of the month. A um, couple of announcements. Next month's Condor Zoom chat will be presented by Mike Stake, one of our wildlife biologists, uh, who will be talking about the vultures of the world. There are 23 species of vultures around the world, and unfortunately, 12 of them are endangered or threatened. And so Mike's going to give a nice overview of the vultures of the world. Um, shortly after that, on September 5th, we're going to have an online auction, our first ever attempt, um, obviously precipitated by our current situation, and we hope that you can join us. We'll send you more information about that uh, shortly. Um, one of the exciting things about that event is we're going to hear from a gentleman by the name of Les LeBeau, who uh, actually wrote the Endangered Species Act years ago, and he's going to uh, he was going to speak in person at our event last April. We couldn't do that, so instead he's going to be able to re record a, a video. Uh, so uh, hopefully that'll all work out and you'll all get to hear from him directly. Uh, just an amazing guy. Um, so um, the other thing I wanted to mention is we have an ongoing matching grant opportunity with U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, the agency that permits our work to reintroduce California condors to the wild. We can match uh, one to one up to $360,000, which is a major uh, portion of our condor program. And we, and we have until December 31 uh, to, to reach that match. So if you're thinking about making a contribution, please consider uh, that. Fentana Wildlife Society has been around since 1982. When we were founded, our mission is to uh, conserve native wildlife and their habitats through research, education, and collaboration. We've been working with California condors for over 20 years. Uh, we're the only nonprofit that's actively releasing condors in California, and we work very closely with all of our zoo partners and many, many partners. That's why collaboration is so important to our organization. Uh, before Connors, we successfully restored a population of bald eagles to Central California, and we're very proud of those results. <clears throat> so um, one of the things that I was noticing when I was scanning the list today um, is we have people from all over the country, Maryland, Virginia, Oregon, uh, New Mexico, Texas, Alabama. Of course, most of you are from California, but I just thought I'd share how nice it is, even though we're cooped up inside and dealing with COVID-19, at least we can connect in this way. And so I thank you all for being here today. And I'd like to introduce Joe Burnett, our Senior Wildlife Biologist and Condor Program uh, Manager. And he's going to give us an update and talk a little bit about the technology that we use to restore condors to the wild. So thank you for coming. Hey, everybody. Um, thanks for joining in tonight. Thanks, Kelly. Um, yeah, this is a exciting time for the Condor Project. Um, uh, myself, I've actually been working with condors since 1997. So um, I've been with Ventana Wildlife Society, so it's been a real honor to follow the recovery and be a part of the recovery of the species. And I work with a, an incredible crew, um, two of which who are um, on the Zoom tonight and will be helping me field questions at the end. Um, that's Amy List and Darren Gross. Um, so their names are going to pop up in a bit. Uh, Stephanie Herrera and Evan McGreek could not be here today. They're actually out in the field. Evan was out looking at a nest, and Stephanie was out act actually out tracking birds. So unfortunately, they couldn't make it to the meeting, but just to know they're out there helping the birds, and uh, we commend them for it. So today I'm here to give a kind of a brief update. Uh, I kind of want to talk about some basics about condor and then get into where the flock is uh, right now and the exciting news of nesting this year. We have some, a really incredible year on, um, on tap. So to get started here, um, again, you know, I, when I started back in 1997 is when we started releasing condors. Uh, we partner, one of our really important partners uh, in Central California is Pinnacles National Park. We began releasing, they began releasing in 2003, and together we're working together to uh, reintroduce and establish condors in Central California. 
This is part of a larger effort led by Fish and Wildlife Service to bring the species back to the entire state. So this is a, an exciting role and important, a role we take very importantly. Um, right now, if you include chicks in nests, we're at over 104 condors in the wild in Central California. That's groundbreaking, uh, you know, to reach the 100, the 100 mark, the century mark was a major milestone for us um, and we're pretty excited. Globally, there are over 500 condors. Um, roughly half of those are in the wild, half are in captivity. Um, there's other wild populations in Southern California, Arizona, and down in Baja, Mexico. Um, we get asked this a lot. Um, condors have actually been feeding since shortly after we started releasing them. They started finding food on their own on the coast. It was whales and all sorts of stuff. And, and, and inland is anything big as a cow to as small as a ground squirrel. Um, so we're excited to report that condors have been feeding on their own for quite some time. Um, and then also condors have been nesting in the wild over, we're now in our 14th year um, in Central California. Uh, so since 2006. So really exciting to see this flock growing and, and increasing in numbers. Uh, another question we've had recently, obviously COVID is um, at the forefront of everything we're doing. How has it impacted condors? Fortunately, we haven't seen the disease itself impact the species. Uh, we of course are monitoring that. There's obviously no guarantees, um, but we, uh, fortunately most human diseases don't transfer to birds. Um, as a crew, we've been exercising our own uh, precautions and we still have been managed to conduct a lot of our field work including recapturing birds for radio transmitters which is a really I'll talk later about is really important to the project. Another thing we've been practicing we take it another step further. <laughs> so they're six foot but of course a condor has a nine and a half foot wingspan and just to be a little safer we go with we're promoting the nine and a half foot wingspan social distancing so uh, had to throw that one in there. So some condor facts. Uh, condors have been listed endangered since 1967. Uh, condors are New World vultures. They're related to turkey vultures and Andean condors. Um, technically, Andean condors are the largest flying um, vulture. At, they have a slightly bigger wingspan than, than condors, but condors are the largest flying bird in North America. Condors are long-lived. We think they live at least 40 to 50 years in the wild, maybe as long as 60. Um, they have a slow reproductive rate. They lay one egg every other year so they can raise a chick. They, the chicks spend about a year and a half with mom and dad, so they have to take off a year. Um, they are obligate scavengers, uh, meaning they only eat dead stuff. So they are a very specialized scavenger um, and very important. So yeah, how big is nine? Nine and a half feet is pretty big. I mean, if you spread your wings out, your wingspan is probably five, six feet. Um, I always ask kids to hold hands and two kids will make about the wingspan of a condor. Um, they also are pretty tall. Um, they have a, about a, they stand about two and a half feet tall and they weigh 17 to 25 pounds. Um, and that's really big for a flying soaring bird like the condor, especially a bird that can fly up to 200 miles in a day with only flapping its wings a few times. So condors are nature's perfect glider, very efficient, they're cleaning up, they they're spend their time soaring the landscape looking for um, stuff to clean up, basically dead animals, and they can use very little energy doing that. And so condors are gonna be found in real steep terrain. They like steeper areas um, the, where the uplift is good. So that's uh, another characteristic. You can see on this photo, um, you can see the white underwing patches of the condor. That's probably the clearest ID that you can get on a condor, and I'll compare it here with some other species, you can see at the top there, you got a turkey vulture, and the lighter part of the wing is on the trailing edge. Um, and then obviously with a bald eagle, you have a white tail and a white head, and then down there at the bottom with the condor, you have those two distinct triangular underwing markings. So that's a great way if you see them in the field, if you're trying to figure out who's who, that's a good place to start. Condors go through a lot of changes. Um, you know, that a young condor, some people will ask, oh, I thought I saw a condor, but it didn't have the red head. And it's like, that's totally normal. Condors, when they're juveniles, are basically one to two years old, they'll have this darker fuzzy head that as they transition from about two to six years old, it starts to turn. And then they become that brilliant, beautiful guy there on the right. <laughs> Bald is beautiful, folks, let me tell you. And uh, this, uh, you can see really cool, um, their adaptations on their, their, you can just see their, their beak and their eye and just everything about their coloration is pretty incredible. 
So they're really well adapted scavengers. This isn't a job for any, just any animal. They have over time evolved to be a specialist and nature's evolved to have, they have these really sharp beaks, incredibly strong beaks. That's the part we worry about when we handle a condor is the beak. Um, they have great vision. Um, you can see here, they even have these feathers underneath their eyes that we think that they evolved to reduce glare when they're flying over the landscape. They have a serrated tongue, which is if you're a scavenger and trying to scrape meat out, it's a really good tool to have. And of course, a bald head is easy to clean after you stick your head in a carcass. So really well adapted birds. And condors, again, they feed on anything as big as a whale to as small as a ground squirrel. So they're really opportunistic eaters. And that would, that's what makes their niche and the ecosystem so important. So they're eliminating disease on all levels. So if condor eats something dead, what goes in comes out clean. So it's a really important process. And in this photo, you can see even a turkey vulture joining in the fun down there in the bottom right corner uh, that's trying to sneak in for a sneak on that piece of meat there while those other two are <laughs> distracted. So yeah, and um, again, this is the most, uh, we found this was the first whale they found in 2006. It was a historic moment. First time since Lewis and Clark, a condor, condors have been seen feeding on a dead whale. Um, the last time was up on the Oregon Mount, you know, the mouth of the Columbia on the Oregon, um, on the Columbia River up in Oregon. So that was, a, that was a huge moment for our project to know that these birds could feed on their own. There was plenty of food out there, plenty of habitat, Plenty of places to nest. Courtship and breeding is amazing with condors. Like most animals, it, uh, condors are very unique and they have this really, the males will do this incredible uh, courtship display to females. It's not always, uh, you know, it's not always received well, but they keep trying and eventually a female will, will find a suitor and the display works. But you can see in this photo, the someone says, describes the, describe the color of a condor's head and neck. And I think I see about five different colors here, from orange to yellow to pink to blue. So it's a really dynamic bird that communicates a lot through that type of communication. And they're not, counters don't have vocal cords. They can only make a handful of sounds and we don't think most of those aren't for communicate. So a lot of their communication is nonverbal and they are highly social. I mean, they live long, they have these tight pair bonds. Um, we, we nickname them out in the field, flying primates. They're so, the hierarchy is so dynamic. Um, they have these long relationships with each other, um, especially pairs. So they're really uh, a unique, almost, you know, it's not something you typically identify with birds, um, this type of behavior. So yeah, they lay one egg every other year. It's about the size of an avocado, um, a Haas avocado, which is about a half pound. It's the closest, you know, thing I know of that, that, that is close to the size of a condor egg. It's pale green in color. Um, so it's about four inches by two and a half inches long um, in, you know, in size. And they incubate the egg for an average of about 57 uh, days before it hatches. Uh, where do they nest? Um, on the coast, the, the favorite nest is a redwood cavity. And this one is a burned out cavity. So fire uh, creates these uh, burned out hollows that the birds use in trees like redwoods. So it's an interesting relationship to see that fire actually benefits condors and creating these nest spaces. Condors also um, nest in caves. Here's a really cool shot. This isn't of caves, of redwoods. On the right there, you can see one of our biologists in a tree about to put a nest cam in. And then um, on the left there, you can see the size, how these trees are so massive. Uh, they even make a condor look small. So pretty amazing. Uh, big bird picks a big tree. So um, it, it's a been a really amazing relationship. And also Connor's nest in caves. Um, caves are, again, these are, uh, they don't build nests. So they're just going and finding these cavities that are very protected from predators. Ideally, they're up on a cliff. Um, and there are, some of these caves are huge, like two or three of us can fit inside them. And the same with some of these redwood cavities. You know, to fit a 10 foot wingspan bird, it's gotta have a lot of space. So they're in the nest for six months. Um, at about 30 days old, about every 30 days, these birds gain about four pounds. And so by, this is a bird that's one month old. You can see it's just got down fuzz. It doesn't have any flight feathers yet. So it eventually will evolve, I mean evolve, grow and develop more feather growth. In about four months, they're almost full grown. And some of the feathers are coming in, most of the contour feathers and 
primary feathers are coming in. Oh, not quite there yet. Remember, everybody, turn off your uh, mute your uh, mics. Just a heads up. <laughs> Thanks, Gabriel. <laughs> and at six months, the chicks are ready to leave the nest. And by now, you can see in this photo, they have beautiful, you can see those beautifully grown, perfect primary feathers, the ones on the end of the wing. Um, it's ready to go. The, uh, the funny thing is their first flights are always their worst flights, and they usually crash land. And fortunately, condors are built for that. They're kind of robust. They're pretty tough birds, and they learn real quick. Um, and mom and dad are there to encourage these guys along the whole way. So that's kind of um, full circle on condor life history. And then another question we get, um, a lot of people ask this, is why in the project do we tag the birds? Um, this is an important uh, part of our work in knowing who indiv each individual is. And then the tag, the color combos help us figure out really quick what age bird that is. You know, so like right here in the photo, you have 99, but the red equals one. So it's a 199 is the number of this bird. And I can quickly know it's an adult. And then we have a whole slew of colors there you can see um, from purple to green. You can go to condorspotter.com and look up any bird you see in the field, the last two numbers and the color of the tag, and it will tell you who you saw. Um, the other really critical part of this tag is we have a transmitter attached to it. And this is a way for us to find out where, not only where condors are going, but if a condor were to get in trouble, either sick or actually even die, it's a means for us to recover the bird and find out what it died of, or a means to get there in time to save it. So it also is really important for us to see where they're nesting, where they're going to protect um, not only them, but places they find important. Um, so this is uh, part of it. And one of the really cool parts is technology is getting so much better. And that's what we wanted to, I wanted to mention today. This, one of the coolest technologies we have right now is GPS technology for transmitters. And these first came about um, in 2003 and have evolved over the last almost 20 years to in the last 10 years to get even more high tech. And this data has been mind blowing in terms of providing us an insight on where these birds go. And so this map kind of captures it on the next page. This is how we've determined how far they can fly. We, we used to think they could fly about 100, 150 miles in a day. We know now it's closer to two, 250 because of these tags. Um, we also know where the birds like to hang out. And it also tells us when these birds can make these huge flights. And you can see the yellow arrows show you from where the core area of Big Sur and Pinnacles, where these birds have taken off to. We've had birds go almost all the way up to Livermore. And again, they're following the mountain ranges. They're going up the Diablos, uh, you know, up in, and if they head south, they're going to Gabilin, they'll hit the uh, Tehachapis, go across, and even over in the Southern Sierras. Um, I wouldn't say this is a common flight pattern, but we do have birds typically in the summer. We get a handful of birds that take off on these big flights. So it's really fascinating to see, um, to see technology really benefiting conservation and helping us protect the condors and really understand what they do, where they nest, where they fly to. And um, again, the transmitters have been key for us to locate these nests because condors nest in the most rugged remote areas on the planet. So to have this tool is amazing because it's, it's a way we can go find a nest and like what I'm here to give an update on is find their chicks. And we got some great news this year. We have eight chicks total in the wild. This is on track to be a record breaking year, knock on wood. And um, here's a photo of one of the chicks. This was uh, earlier in the next year. This is a chick that surprised us. This pair um, it was a new pair that had actually nested before, and we saw a GPS pattern that indicated a nest site, and it was in a remote area. We hiked out there, and we were able to get this photo and confirm that they actually had a wild chick. So that was a huge surprise. The best surprise you get as a condor biologist. <laughs> and we found more. Uh, we have five in redwoods this year, and they're all in burned out cavities of redwoods. So really, those redwood the redwood fire relationship we never knew was so important um, and that, that it's making up for more than half our nest in Central California. And three are in caves. We have one nest that's actually, you know, around, we have three in caves right around the Pinnacles area. So Pinnacles obviously is an important area for condors and historically always has been because of the, the incredible rock formations and the great foraging grounds they have around Pinnacles. So it's a great, uh, and again, birds from Big Sur or Pinnacles, they're one flock. 
the birds in a given day will go from Big Sur to Pinnacles multiple times. So we don't really characterize the flock or separate it that way. So it's kind of a, um, it's become one flock now. And even now with Southern California, the flock down there, the birds are mixing more. So it's pretty exciting times for condors for sure. So this year was really exciting. We, we upgraded our condor nest cam that the last time this cam was activated was 2018. This is a, an awesome partnership we started with explore.org. And they basically provide the camera. Obviously we are the ones who put it in the nest. Uh, we do it in the off season. And I can't even um, tell you how technology has evolved. This camera is solar powered. Uh, it's very remote. Everything's wireless. So the, the disturbance to the birds is minimal. I mean, it's, it's, we have our power grid set up. So technology is just more and more helping us gain insights to these birds. And I can't even explain the, the, the value of seeing inside a condor nest along with the viewers. I mean, you guys are seeing it for the first time with us. That you're able to see these intimate, really awesome moments with the chick and the parents, and you see the chick literally grow right in front of your eyes. So words can't even put it, you know, you can't even put a price tag on it. It's just been one of the most incredible insights we've ever had. So again, technology and conservation isn't, technology isn't always such a bad thing. It's really come to be a great tool for, for condor, at least condor conservation. So the pair featured on the cam this year were the same pair in 2018. They nest in a, a coastal redwood. Uh, we got king put or, kingpin and redwood queen. Um, I could talk, give a whole presentation just about these two birds. I love these birds. I've known them for a long time. But long story short, they are our most experienced and our most pr productive pair. They've produced nine chicks since 2007. So these guys are just, you can go look up, I recommend you go look up their bios. Um, and it's on our website under the Ventana WS.org and learn more about them. So they last nested in 2018. And for those of you who watched, they raised Pasquale on the nest cam. We all got to watch him grow up and we finally got to see him released. It was pretty amazing. Um, people have been asking, so where is Pasquale? And the great question is he's doing wonderfully. Um, he loves to actually hang out over at Pinnacles. Go figure, he grew up on the coast and now he likes it hanging out inland. Uh, and just a couple weeks ago, we got, we were able to recapture um, 914 to replace his radio tag, which had stopped working. Um, and here's a photo of Evan holding uh, 914 and getting ready to release them. And also when we grab these birds, we take a little blood sample because um, a lot of these birds, we want to know where their lead value's at. Um, the leading mortality threat to condors right now is lead poisoning. So we always take, and the lead poisoning is, um, they, become, they can become lead poisoned if they ingest a car meat from a carcass that's been shot with spent lead ammunition. So we're still monitoring um, the bird's exposure to lead, and that we can do through a, a small blood sample. So Pasquale is doing great. That's great news. We all got to see this, this bird. He fledged right in front of our eyes. Um, so it was really cool to see it come full circle and to see him out there thriving. And that brings us to this year's uh, featured condor, Aniko. And we welcomed Aniko on April 25th. He hatched right on the cam. Um, and the cool part about this year's cam is it's an upgraded cam. It's HD and we have a better internet feed. And so the the quality, I can't get over it, is just unbelievable. And these are, these are snapshots from the camera from when the top left shot there is when he was only a, a week old. And I'm not he, we actually don't know the gender. Um, we uh, will find out. We actually will do a blood sample from this bird when he's about a year or he or she is a year old. We'll recapture him and be able to get a blood sample, send that off, and they can tell us not only to confirm who the parents are, because sometimes the parents aren't who they seem to be. Um, we've had birds checked where the female actually uh, was with some another male, even though she raised the chick with another one. So lots of drama going on in California. <laughs> this pair, not so much, but uh, we never know. Um, but the main thing we find from that uh, blood sample is the gender. And so in about, a, in probably about six, seven, probably about eight months from now, we'll know the gender. Until now, he's Chick is just an eco, <laughs> which means born in troubled times. And we, we found that name to be really appropriate uh, with everything going on this year. Um, but anyway, this, these photos really capture how fast 
and Nico's growing. He was now three months old. Can't believe that the, uh, he, this chick is that old already. And you can see through these photos, just the, the mass amount of growth um, that the chick has gone through. The bottom left is probably about a month. The top right is two months. And then this photo on the bottom right is just from a couple days ago. So this, and Nico is growing up fast. And you guys are probably seeing a lot of different behavior on here, including feedings by the parents. Um, this is a recent shot. I wanted to, I took a still shot of a video. This is of his wingspan, which, or he, she, Nico's wingspan. And you can really see the feather growth coming in on the trailing edge of the wings. You can see this. These are uh, secondaries that are closest to the body. And the primaries are just starting to grow. And so amazing. Everything's looking great. This Aniko's looking totally normal. Uh, we're guessing Aniko's weight right now is about 12 pounds. So about, you know, a little less than half, a little more over halfway there in terms of growth. Um, Aniko will be, uh, at six months, he'll be full, or he or she will be full grown. So that's when we, you'll see a, a Nico really looking like a condor. And that's when we'll actually switch the camera and activate, there's an outside camera, so we can capture the action of when a Nico leaves the nest for the first time. And we're excited to, to, um, for that moment. But it's probably a couple months out before we activate the outer nest camera. But just so everybody knows, that is in the, that is in the works. And again, technology at, at its finest. Um, a lot of times you'll watch in the nest and you'll just see a Nico looking out, where the heck are mom and dad? And uh, we're wondering that too, but it's pretty normal. As, the, as a Nico gets older, ma, the feed, feed, feeding demands become bigger. So mom and dad have to go a little further, a little uh, to go out and find food to satiate their chick that has is, that is, got a huge appetite. Um, so the feedings might get spread out right now. We're seeing about every one to two days and that's totally normal. And so condor ch chicks like Aniko spend a lot of time by themselves taken in their environment, but they are very visually oriented. He is, uh, Aniko has seen so much of the landscape. The view from inside the, the redwood, you can see all the trees around and there's other wild condors that are flying around that, that I'm pretty sure Aniko spots and he can watch like right here, I think a Nico is watching uh, um, somebody flying overhead or maybe a hawk or something else. So um, you can only imagine what, what the world looks like through the eyes of a Nico right now. Um, so earlier in June, we had the pair bring back, uh, we saw these trash items, we call them micro trash. These two plastic items showed up in the nest. And we started getting a lot of comments and this is um, something that does happen um, in a lot of condor nests. Um, we tend not to worry about it as long as it's not too much. It's not ideal by any means to have any micro trash in the nest, but fortunately condors are built to regurgitate, whether when they eat something with a lot of bones and fur, condors naturally cast it up. They cough it up. They'll keep the, the good stuff, cast up the stuff, and then sometimes they'll keep some of that bone and material in their crop, which is a, is a kind of a pre-stomach that sits on their chest. And they will, they will use that crop to um, grind food and they'll keep bones and other stuff. And sometimes this type of stuff will get into their crop and they can use it. But early on, we noticed that Nico was able, he did swallow this stuff and he was able to cast it back up. So that was an encouraging sign for us. And since then, we haven't seen any new trash items. So um, I think these have been casted up and they're probably buried in the nest somewhere or Nico is using them in his crop to help grind food. Um, this amount of trash were, is not uh, something we typically worry about. And I always encourage people to help, you know, when you're out cleaning up trash, it's not only the big stuff, you know, it's not the big soda can, it's the little, it's the, it's the lid to the soda can or the soda bottle. That can be really is a lot of big time issue for uh, a lot of wildlife. And I, as everyone knows, some of this stuff ends up in the ocean. And, you know, the, the general rule is just the best way to help out condors. If you're ever in the Big Sur areas and you see trash along the highway, pick it up. You know, if you've got time, just stop and pick up some trash. And even in your, your own areas where you live, it's very helpful, not only for the aesthetic part, but just to help all animals. And um, so that's a great way to help. Um, the parent chick bond um, is something like no other. I think this is probably one of the coolest um, 
behavioral things you'll you'll see with condors and i think it surprises people to see condor i don't know if it's because they're birds but to see this real um affectionate behavior between the parents and the chick and um i got a video here and um i'm just going to keep talking while it's going but they're just hanging out on a, this is just a normal day and um, dad has dropped down and he's now, you can see him there preening, he's preening the back of a Nico and, and Nico just hates it. <laughs> he's, it's just a really cool moment. And here they are nibbling beaks and you can just, I can watch this stuff for hours. This is stuff we never really knew about, um, how intimate these birds could be and the, how deep the bonds were they had with their, with their young and um, this, this form of play they do, you know, and they say um, they rate intelligence based on the amount of play an animal does. And, it, and if you rate that, then condors are highly intelligent because they do a ton of play time with their chick and just, and just, uh, especially dad, God, he just hangs out all the time with the chick. And here he's just playing with each other's beaks. And it's just, uh, and this is just a tidbit of what, what we've been seeing. So um, yeah, it's just been a really amazing, um, amazing year, not only for condor production, but amazing year for learning about, we knew this species was amazing, but now it's just taken it to a whole other level. Um, and thanks to technology. So here's, uh, this is a, a video. I was gonna wait a little bit. This is a recent video. He's been, Nico's, I keep saying he, I mean he, she. <laughs> uh, and Nico has been getting very active. Um, and this is normal. They're, and I, we get comments, is he gonna jump out? Is an ego gonna jump out of the nest? And thankfully, hopefully not. Um, they typically don't. They, they're definitely curious to look over the edge and teeter with the edge. But for the most part, you know, 99% of the time, condors won't take that giant leap until they're ready. So it's, um, it's a pretty cool thing to watch. And here, the chick begins to do, a, we call it a hop flap dance. And they start to, uh, they start to spin and hop and it looks like they're going crazy, but it's, uh, it's a means of exercising and they're, they're kind of just exerting this, this pinned up energy. You can imagine being a, you have this giant wingspan and you can barely spread it out in that cavity. And so they, any chance they get, they try to get those wings. Here he's got a feather in his mouth. <laughs> so he ended his dance with a little feather, feather uh, in his mouth, which was really cool. And hopefully everyone was able to see that. Um, sometimes the videos have a little lag, so I'm going to just let that sit. But that's it for our, uh, for my presentation. Um, I did want to, um, address, uh, some questions we got from the, from everyone, uh, who participated in the Zoom today. We had questions sent ahead of time, and I'm going to get help with the questions from, um, Darren and Amy, who are also, are you guys there? Yeah, yep. I'm here, Joe. Thanks, guys. Yeah, here, too. Cool. Yeah, we got some, uh, we got some really good questions. And uh, Amy and Darren, you guys can just take turns uh, hitting them up. What do you think? Sure, sounds good. Yeah, works for me. All right, so, Amy, here's one. How often are mom and dad coming to feed a Nico? Um... Well, I think you kind of talked about this in your presentation, but it's every one to two days. Um, but they're definitely around a lot more than that. You just might not see them on the camera because they'll be outside the tree. They'll be in the area, in the canyon, um, just keeping watch. While you were answering that question, I just switched to the live feed of a Nico. So he's, nice. looking, oh, he's, he's, looking cute. <laughs> he's looking pretty mellow right now, but you never know. He might pick up. He might uh, get excited here. Um, here's a question, Darren, any update on genetic diversity in the population? Um, yeah, nothing too significant, but, um, yeah, I mean, genetic diversity in the population is doing well. Um, a lot of the captive breeding, uh, analyzes sort of what's going on with, with that and the, and how the, how the genes are in the population. But, but yeah, things are, are uh, looking good, but, but yeah, it's something that's closely examined and, and looked at as we, uh keep managing these birds and get, get uh, more into the population. Awesome, thanks. Um, Amy, are we gonna be able to see him once he leaves the nest? 
maybe from that outside cam um, when that gets going, but it might be a little tricky. Um, but we will do our best to keep you posted on Aniko's progress. Um, but you know, once he leaves that little area, that's where our cameras are. So then the live feed will unfortunately end. But we will keep you posted as he explores Big Sur, or she explores. <laughs> exactly. Right. I caught the trap I did. <laughs> um, so, uh, Darren, how is the lead issue in Condors progressing? Um, maybe you can speak to how you've been helping out with Ventana with um, the lead issue. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, so lead is a uh, lead is still an issue for the condors all like all throughout Central California and in Southern California. But uh, things are looking up. Our uh, the Don Lead uh, Ammunition Program that I'm I'm a part of. Uh, we're we're getting more and more participants every day. Um, so we're just trying to get more um, non lead out into uh, out in well out to the hunters that are uh, hunting in these environments that the condors are also using to to do what we can to reduce the lead issue. Um, but yeah, it's something we'll st we're uh, still fighting, um, but we're hoping to see um, uh, more and more encouraging results uh, as more hunters are using non-lead. Cool, great, thanks. And I have two of the same question here. How long before a Nico fledges? Um, it's normally about six months. So with a Nico's ha um, hatch date, we are expecting a fledge on roughly October 2nd, give or take, you know, they do it in their own time, but that's, that's the ballpark. Good deal. Um, how many condors are chelated each year? Darren? Yeah, uh, I'm not too sure on the number. I know um, for us, it's been, it's gone down each year, but, um, but yeah, we still get birds here and there. Uh, when we do our uh, trap ups to do health checks that, that need to go uh, go in for chelation. Yeah, there's a lot of fluctuation. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, we got how many wild hatchlings this year? I'll go ahead and answer that one. We have eight. Um, knock on wood, all of them make it. They, they still have a ways to go. Um, so, you know, we're hoping we, we end up with eight. Um, but things are looking great so far. But all the chicks are roughly the same age. I, think, I don't know if we mentioned that. They're all about from three to four months old. Um, I think our oldest chick is almost four months. So yeah, there's a little bit of a range there. Um, let's see. Um, let's see this text box. When is it best to see the condors and where? Uh, Amy, you wanna take that one? Uh, sure. Um... Well, that's a little tricky because they they go wherever they want, but um, Big Sur, of course, is a great place. I'd say from Andrew Malera all the way down south past uh, Julia Pfeiffer McWay. If you just watch the ridge, keep your eyes out, you can see them flying around. Um, you can also see them in Pinnacles National Park, which I believe is now open again, although check before you go. Um, you know, everything's constantly changing. Um, but the High Peaks Trail in Pinnacles is a really good spot to see them as well. Great answer. Um, so, Darren, here's a good question. Where do mom and dad spend the night while Aniko is in the nest? Um, at least one of them will be roosting nearby. Uh, they're not too far away from the nest, but they, uh, they tend to stay in, in trees nearby. They're kind of out of sight, um, but, but yeah, they're, they're never too far. And then we have a final question. Um, why don't the condor parents attack the scientists as they come to check the nest? Um, well, with this nest, we've been managing a lot more remotely. Um, thanks to the camera, we really don't have to hike up there and check the nest because we're getting the best view from our laptops um, along with everybody else. Uh, when we check other nests though, we always do it from a, a respectful and non-disruptive distance. We use a spotting scope, so we're, we're well far away. The condor parents definitely do still notice our presence there, um, but you know, they just watch us as we watch their chicks and then we leave and it's all fine. Awesome. All right, well, that's the questions I have from the list. Um, we probably have enough time to take a few questions from 
Hey, Joe. There's yeah, um, go ahead, questions Kathy. rolling in on the chat right now. Maybe Darren and Amy would like to kind of tackle those. Sure. Yeah, we can. Uh, can everyone see the chat? I'm I'm trying to find it here. Oh yeah, it's just on the bottom of your screen, Joe. Um, let's see. Um, here's one from Karen White. For the most part, do juveniles remain with their natal flock permanently? That's a great question. Um, it seems so. Uh, I think we've had, it's pretty rare for a, a condor from the Southern California flock. Sometimes they'll come for a visit, but they do usually go back to the flock that they were born in. Um, but I think Joe can answer this one better, but I think it has happened once or twice, maybe. Pardon me, what was the question again? Um, the question is, for the most part, do juveniles remain with their natal flock permanently? Yeah, I would say, I would say for the most part, um, well, you know, like look at Pasquale, I think looking at, we have to start, for us as biologists, we've even had to teach ourselves to start looking at the flock as a broader flock, and it's kind of cool to, they will stay, I think we definitely see the juveniles come back and check in, uh, wild-fledged juveniles, um, but for the most part, uh, I think just because the flock is growing, these birds can spread out more, and I think that's a good thing. Yeah, definitely. Um, let's see, here's another one. If a Nico gets in trouble, will you get to him or her and help? Um, we'll do our best. We do try to help any condors that we observe with any kind of, um, you know, clinical signs of injury or illness, but ultimately these are wild birds um, and they have a vast territory, so we do our absolute best to keep track of them and take care of them, but um, yeah, they, they, they also, you know, just like any other wild animal, um, things can happen. But yeah, we'll be on the lookout for sure. Yeah, I got one here. Um, when condors travel long distances, uh, do they make multi-day trips or do they return home each day? Um, and it can depend. I mean, sometimes birds will just fly out all day and then return back, but it's not uh, uncommon for them to take multi-day trips either. Um, so they can go pretty far and uh, they're, they're not really too tied in until they're nesting. They're not really too tied into a, to a particular territory. So they can go pretty far. Um, here's another question from Pat Patricia who asked, um, is that eight chicks in all of California or just in Ventana? Those eight chicks are in the central California flock. So that is Ventana and then also all the way over to Pinnacles. It's one flock managed by two organizations, and I don't have the exact numbers for chicks in the other California condor flocks, but um, I'm sure there are chicks, maybe Joe. Yeah, I believe it's two or three, or um, they're having a little bit of an off year, which happens, um, but I think it's, they're, they're hoping by the end of it, maybe four. So we got our fingers crossed, but that would be a great year for the state to have 12 chicks fledging as a whole, and sometimes we have low years, they have big years, so it's, um, there's some variation for sure, um, but yeah, I think we had, what, 13 pairs attempt this year, or 13 nest attempts, and we had eight chicks. Yeah, so that's something pretty good. That's in Central California, so that's pretty good. Mm -hmm. And if we can get all eight chicks to fledge, that would be incredible. But they have some, definitely have some natural obstacles, you know, they have natural predators, golden eagles um, to tend with. Um, and, you know, just even landing in a spot on the ground too long could potentially um, be an issue. So, yeah, they're not out of the clear by any means. They got to not only after they, they got to make it to leave the nest, then once they leave the nest, the, the challenges start. So, you know, life in the wild is definitely a, they got their work cut out for them. Um, let's see, here's a question from Kathleen. Have any of Kingpin, Kingpin and Redwood Queen's offspring had chicks of their own? Joe, do you remember? Which ones? Um, have any of Kingpin and Redwood Queen's offspring had chicks of their own? Are they, so are no, they grandparents? No, not, uh, 444 four did. Um, mm. 444 um, died a couple years ago, but before she died, she actually did, um, she hatched a chick at Pinnacles. I don't think the chick made it, but um, that was the first time we had a, a one of our wild fledged birds go on the nest. And then we also have the other pair in Big Sur 538, 574, who are both wild fledges and they've been nesting successfully now for, they're going on their um, 
So we got two, at least two chicks from that, that pair. Mm -hmm. Yeah, next year will hopefully be their third year. So they've been super successful. And that's really the ultimate when you have your offspring, wild offspring now breeding on their own. Mm -hmm. So it was really cool when we had um, a wild male and wild female decide to pair up and they, uh, they actually chose a redwood, in the, which was um, you know, just really cool to see it come full circle. Yeah, they're doing great. Um, I love this question from Ben Wallace. How strong can they bite? Uh, really strong, really strong. You have to really strong enough. <laughs> when you're handling condors. Um, but if you think about what they eat, that really, that really gives a clue into how, how sharp and strong those beaks are because they're made to get through really thick cowhide, so like leather basically, and they can just rip right into it. Or, you know, the skin of an elephant's heel, even a whale, you know, they'll get into no problem. So, yeah, they are really well designed to get through tough Awesome stuff. tool. Yeah, it's an awesome, awesome tool. <laughs> we respect it. Yes. Yeah. Um, uh, here's a question from uh, Ethan Oania. I apologize if I butchered the pronunciation of your last name, but um, how do the condors avoid getting bacterial infections from the dead animals? Um, Condors have like really strong uh, stomachs and really strong acid in their stomachs that can that kills off a lot of the like any bacteria or viruses or anything they could uh, get put like that we would get sick from from eating something like that. Um, so so that's mostly how they're able to avoid uh, infections and other other things. Yeah, they have iron guts, <laughs> iron stomachs. Um, let's see. This one from Judy says. I heard that condors from the Southern California flock have been seen in Sequoia National Park, which is true, very exciting. Um, is it reasonable to think that the two flocks will start to intermingle at some point? If yes, any idea when that might happen? Um, so that's already happened a bit. Um, every now and then condors from Central California will make a trip down south or vice versa. Um, they typically go along the coastal ranges though, in between the Central Valley um, really, really limits it. There's, you know, they need to, um, they need those good thermals to travel long distances. So going from uh, Sequoia straight west over to Central California would probably be pretty tricky for a condor. Not that they couldn't do it. They are always surprising us, but um, I think if we see more exchange between the flocks, it will be along the routes that we've seen before. Um, but yeah, we're just waiting to see. I think as the population increases, we'll be seeing more and more of that, hopefully. I don't know if everyone's distracted. I, this is uh, Aniko doing a little hop flap dance earlier today. <laughs> Aniko's loving holding the feather as, he does, as the dance happens. It's pretty funny. It's definitely becoming a, uh, a regular thing. All right, any more questions on there? Hey, Joe, I just want to answer one that I think was skipped. There was a question about the Oakland Zoo, one of our partners, and we are concerned about them as well. They are going through some, some difficulties with the COVID-19. It affects the condors uh, probably in two ways. Uh, they've been providing some financial support as well as veterinary support. Um, but I think the latter would still continue. I think their vet staff are still on board. So if we had a condor that was sick or injured and needed treatment, uh, we most likely would, would still be able to, to work with Oakland Zoo in that way. Um, but uh, as far as the financial gift this year, it's highly unlikely. Thanks, Kelly. Were there any others? Um, uh, from Sandy, how and when will Aniko be captured and how do you know it's him, her, and not another chick? Great question. Um, and I think somebody else asked how we capture the condors. So we have a, we call it a flight pen. It's basically a really large um, aviary and attached to that is a little chain link box and in there it has doors to the inside and outside and we'll place some food for the condors inside that little trap and me or Darren or Joe or Stephanie or any of the other biologists will sit in what we call blind. It's got two-way glass and we'll wait for the condor that we want to walk in the trap. Then we'll close the door. Um, 
and then they'll, from there they'll be transferred into the larger holding area until we're ready to handle them. Um, but then we have to take a blood sample to see which condor they are. Um, so it is, it is a whole process. It takes some time to get the DNA results back, um, but we eventually we get it all sorted out and they get their final tag. And um, yeah, and then yeah, we can- so Right now we have, um, and Amy can speak to it, we have a couple birds that are in that, well, we just, we finished catching the birds that fledged from the wild last year. And again, when we catch them, if we have more than two that are, uh, that are on tag, we, there's no way to really tell who they are unless we get that blood sample back. So we put on temporary tags. And so this year we have temporary um, tags on a, on a handful of birds. And once we get the genetics results back of the, not only the gender, but who the parents are, we can confirm, oh, that chick is from this nest site. And then when the next time we catch them, um, probably another year out, we'll, we'll put the correct tag on them with the correct stud book. And yeah, those numbers that I mentioned are the stud book numbers. Those are assigned. It's an international stud book that's, um, that's governed for all species, especially endangered species. And, but we do also name the birds as, as part of nicknaming and um, so folks can identify with them better. Um, but for our scientific purposes, we use those stud book numbers. Um, right now, they're, for years, it was only three numbers, but for the first time, we're into the thousands, which is really cool. That's a great, great sign of um, where we, we've come from. Um, we now, uh, just in the last couple of years, have had uh, chicks in the wild that are, you know, the 1,000s. So that's pretty, pretty awesome. We've gone to four digits now in the stud book. <laughs> hey, Joe, um, I'm looking at the clock, and I think we're right uh, near the end, but I see there's, there's two more questions. Uh, Gabriel was wondering how do Congress defend themselves? And then another question uh, about, um, we'll start with that one. I'll, I'll get the other one. Amy Darren, you want to tackle that one? Oh, and how Yeah, I can, uh, I can take it. Um, so, well, well, we mentioned the really strong bite. <laughs> um, that's kind of their... Uh, I guess I'd say first, if they can get away, if they can fly away from something, if it's a predator or whatever, they'll do that uh, immediately. But if, if they're kind of in a pickle, they'll, they'll definitely use that strong bite. Um, they also have pretty powerful legs, not so much squeezing power like uh, um, predatory birds of prey have, but they uh, can kick really hard. Uh, they kind of use that to launch themselves off the ground when, when fighting. So I'm sure they, they do that too. But, but yeah, first instinct for them is if they're in, in trouble, they'll try to fly away. Great, thanks, Darren. And then the, the last question was, how long do condors live? And, and we don't really know, but we think it's well over 50 years. There have been Andean condors that lived in captivity over 70 years. And uh, it, it would not surprise me at all if, if California condors could live to be over 50, which is another reason why I personally just love these birds. I mean, some of these, some of these birds that we've been releasing over the last 20 years, are going to become parents and grandparents and and we're going to just watch this flock grow and, and hopefully with lead poisoning less and less of an issue you know these birds will get a chance to live to be 50 or more and and that's worth working toward so anyway i just uh give joe uh some uh, applause here if you if you would uh, it was a great presentation i want to thank the whole entire condor crew and all of you, our donors, supporters, for joining us today. Thank you so much. Um, some of you have also asked if, if this uh, live chat will be recorded. Well, we do. We have a YouTube channel, which you can also find on our web page. So any of any, uh, these live chats that you may miss moving forward the last Thursday of the month, you can always uh, check it out afterward. Um, but thank you again, and uh, we'll see you next time. Thanks, everyone. Thank you so much. We love it. <laughs> Guys, have a great night. Thank you. Thank you. It was wonderful. Thank you. Be safe out there. Yeah, stay safe, everyone. Thanks for tuning in. Well, thanks for being there. <laughs>